Well, welcome everyone. I just uh, put in the chat the um, one section of the Four Quarters chant that's about gladness or mudita, appreciative joy. And I thought this could be a nice theme for a gathering this evening. And just as a way to begin, let's just chant this one verse together. And then I'll share a little bit before we settle in to about 30 or 40 minutes of meditation time, and then we'll have some time for discussion. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with gladness, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere and to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill will. That's a simple and potent ask, isn't it? Just to, I will abide pervading all quarters with this heart imbued with gladness, appreciating what is beautiful, appreciating what is good, above and below, all around, everywhere and every way. So it's like experimenting with that being <clears throat> the frame, the way of seeing, the way of sensing our world is that, that lens of appreciation that lens that recognizes what's beautiful, simply beautiful, simply good. And this is a nice place to start. I mean, I know we're just looking at most of us, a computer or phone, but you know, we, even in this, with the limitations of Zoom, we, we can have the sense of the other people. And isn't it true that we can have the sense of goodness there are good people here. And just the space of our home, appreciating the goodness there. Above, below, all around in every way. I mean, that's just a vision. What would that be like for me to be living experiencing my life through the lens that can appreciate, that sees what's beautiful and what's good. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable, free from hostility and ill will, I will abide. So in some ways, the meditation on mudita, appreciative joy or gladness is in, you know, for some of us at least, a more challenging practice. But you know how that is. What's more challenging also delivers the goods in terms of healing and the transformation of our heart. So even if in any of the kind of Brahma Bihara practice, divine abode practices that we might do, um, 
there's something about sticking with the theme or the the essence of the practice and it's it's really just a specialized kind of mindfulness practice where we have just this one object here in the present moment that we're keeping in mind however faint or subtle it might be this capacity that's here and now to appreciate what's good and beautiful and we're keeping that in mind and we're keeping that in mind and there'll be lots of tendencies for me to notice what I don't like or what's not so good or any other number of experiences in the present moment, but I'm creatively keeping this capacity to appreciate in mind, keeping in mind, keeping in mind. And we learn this basic principle that in terms of the wholesome, skillful qualities of the heart, if we keep skillful, wholesome qualities in mind, they grow. Like if we actually see a wholesome quality like the capacity to appreciate what's good and beautiful, and we stay interested in it, even if it's not the predominant quality of the mind and heart, we keep it in mind, we stay interested, we participate in the present moment, you know, in terms of how we're thinking, how we're observing, how we're connecting with the moment. So we're not passive. We're very actively involved in reframing the sort of nature of the present moment, what's interesting in the present moment, in order to facilitate keeping mudita, appreciative joy in mind. And in some ways, it's harder when we're out in the daily life, seeing different people interacting than it is when we're sitting, but it kind of there are advantages and disadvantages to doing the mudita through daily life versus doing it in a more meditative way when we're sitting still and turning inward using our imagination primarily. But both have their advantages and disadvantages. So that will be our task during the <clears throat> 35, 40 minutes of guided meditation. And I'll give some instructions, but like it or not, each of us, we're going to be responsible for creatively, nimbly as best we can, keeping appreciation, this ability to keep appreciating what's good and beautiful. The phrase I like and I'll use when I'm giving the guided instructions is something I think I heard first from, <clears throat> excuse me, Guy Armstrong. A lot of you might know he's a longtime teacher at the Insight Meditation Society and actually was on staff, I think, way back at the uh, late 70s in the first years of IMS. And then later has been a really important teacher at Spirit Rock as well. Um, and I, I think once when he was teaching the Mudita practice, he used this phrase of, may this goodness continue, may this beauty or you could be more specific, like if you're thinking of a friend who's really capable and often expresses a real, you know, beautiful generosity, may your generosity, the goodness of your generosity continue, may it increase, may it never end. And the reason I like that phrase, may this continue, this goodness continue, increase, never end, is it really has that flavor of expansion and that's really how we want to experience these qualities of love. And, and most of you know, we have loving kindness or that basic goodness, basic friendliness of the heart. When that basic goodness runs into suffering, we have compassion. When that basic goodness, friendliness of metta runs into something that's beautiful, we have mudita, appreciative joy. And when that basic goodness and any other situation that may be initially at least seem boring or nondescript or ambiguous or confusing or whatever, then we have the love of balance or the love that's expressed as balance, the balance of equanimity. 
the unshakable balance of equanimity. And these are the four qualities of the heart. And tonight we're going to train in being interested in mudita, appreciative joy. And just how can I keep it in mind? And how can I attune to that expansive flavor of appreciation? We might start, you know, you might bring your pet to mind and a particular quality in your pet that you really appreciate, right? Maybe they're friendly <laughs> or maybe they're really lithe, your cat or whatever it is, but oh yeah, that's a beautiful quality. May that goodness of that quality, the beauty of that quality, may it continue. May it increase, may it never end. Now we know that the cat is gonna keep changing and eventually grow old and die or your friend or whatever beautiful thing you're bringing to mind. It might be even a beautiful quality in your own heart, but the wish that it continue and increase and never end, it's really more about, it's not like what we're you know, imagining is gonna happen. It's more about the goodness having that expansive flavor that there is goodness and in a way our heart can hitch a ride on goodness, which has that tendency to expand and radiate out because we're choosing, the mind is choosing to keep goodness, beauty in mind. And it can be really simple things. You might have an image of seeing a six-year-old girl eating an ice cream cone earlier from today, let's say. And that person seemed, that little person seemed happy. Ah, the happiness of eating something you like. May that goodness continue. May it increase, may it never end. May there always be ordinary moments of happiness such as this that I'm remembering. May it continue, may it increase, may it never end. And then again, just, and eventually <clears throat> you'll strategically, creatively bring different people to mind. There may be a particular person and a particular quality in that person that is really resonant, really, uh, and it ignites that quality of mudita for you. So you might just, really rely on that, hitting the same note. May this goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. And then you might let go of the words and you might just feel that radiance, that boundlessness of appreciation. As if the heart is singing, there's a lot of goodness. There's an infinite amount of goodness to appreciate. I don't even need the specific examples of goodness in myself and in others in the world, I can just, in a sense, abide, rest, or even I can even be the mudita, the appreci appreciative joy. So that's the ultimate meditation object is that um, merging, you could say, with the quality of appreciative joy, resting in it, abiding in it, letting it suffuse every aspect of the body, heart, and mind. So there's nothing here that we would call me that isn't that wholesomeness of appreciative joy. So when you can get there, then it actually might be unhelpful to bring a phrase to mind, like the phrase that I recommended, may this goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. It may not be useful once the experience of the radiance of appreciative joy is strong, then let your practice be silent. Don't be repeating or even bringing images to mind because they may be grosser, more dense than the actual quality of your heart in that moment. So always rely on the more subtle expression of the love. But if you need the grosser expression, like to bring a particular person and one of their wholesome qualities to mind that you appreciate, then do that. But when you don't need that or you don't need the phrase, then let go of that.
Okay, so that's just a little introduction to Mudita, appreciative joy practice. Very good. So just do what you need to do to feel comfortable if you want to stretch your body a little bit. <clears throat> and then as best we can, we're going to find a comfortable posture for the meditation where we feel relatively stable in the sitting posture. You might even take a couple of longer, deeper breaths to help settle in. And eventually allowing the breathing to continue on its own. And because this is very much a concentration practice, if it's comfortable for you, do your best to hold the body relatively still. It just makes the practice a little easier. You might want to close your eyes if that's comfortable. And we're just reminding ourselves as if we're making a clear resolve to be interested in mudita, appreciative joy or gladness. And just see who or what comes to mind. So there might even, what might come to mind is one of your own qualities that you really appreciate or even something happening in this moment that you appreciate. But it might be a dear friend who, or a person that you know well, and just remembering something about that person. They might be experiencing a lot of happiness or success in a way that you can appreciate. Or they might have a really beautiful quality I'm thinking of somebody who has a just a very earthy steadfastness, stick to itiveness that I that I naturally appreciate. So once you have some memory, some quality of your own or somebody else's quality that you appreciate, then just recognize this expansive wish. May this beautiful quality continue, may it increase, and may it never end. We just feel the heart appreciating this goodness that we recognize. May it continue and increase and never end. Like an expansive smile that appreciates. And as long as that particular memory or image is helpful, then just keep riding that expansion of mudita, appreciative joy. Use the words as long as they're helpful. Drop them when they're not needed. I care about the goodness in your life. I care about the beauty of your life the beauty of your wholesome qualities. May they continue, may they increase, may they never end. Just continue on your own and remember, if a particular image is seeming dry, just see who else comes to mind or other situations where your heart easily can appreciate.
And if the mind is more at the distracted end, then really rely on the repetition of the phrase as you bring different memories, different aspects that you can appreciate to mind. May this goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. And it's like a new muscle where we're learning how to appreciate what is worthy of our appreciation, like ordinary but very wholesome moments of generosity, moments of patience, moments of truthfulness, moments of resoluteness, wisdom, kindness. These qualities are really worth, worthy of appreciation, whether we see them in ourselves or in others. And of course, the quality of mudita itself is quite wholesome and beautiful. So in those moments when this quality of love is strong, then we'll naturally, the heart will naturally appreciate this appreciative joy itself. It's like a really beautiful, positive feedback mechanism. And just allows the heart to expand and expand until the quality of love suffuses the entire body and mind. Nothing is not touched by appreciative joy. And we learn to abide or rest being mudita, being appreciative joy, like a beautiful radiant smile that understands that there is good, there is beauty, and it's worthy of appreciation.
And of course, you might run into some resistance because this is a powerful counter programming from any tendencies to be judgmental or critical, seeing what's off, seeing what's bad. So we're not cultivating that quality right now, but rather learning to appreciate what is worthy of appreciation, however simple it might be. Even having a functioning body, having a mind that's interested in practice is worthy of appreciation. There are many things worthy of appreciation.
if your mind needs more structure, you can even use the chant we did at the beginning of the evening in the chant, in the chat. I will abide pervading one quarter. That just means the space in front of us with this heart imbued with gladness, appreciative joy. Likewise to my right, likewise behind, to the left, above and below, all around, everywhere and every way, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with this heart imbued with mudita, appreciative joy, gladness, abundant, exalted, boundless, without hostility, without ill will. And so just that repetition will keep the mind from its other distractions And when the heart starts to feel that movement, that expansion of love, then really notice that pleasure of the heart opening, appreciating. It's a kind of healing pleasure that we experience in the heart. That movement towards inclusivity or boundlessness a particular quality that we want to get to know and learn how to abide with, to rest in.
May goodness and love continue, may it increase, may it never end. And in these last minutes, remember when there's some momentum, you don't even need a mental image or phrases. Love for its own sake, appreciation for its own sake. Just allow the heart to radiate goodness in all directions. Just allow yourself to abide, to rest, and in a way to be this love.
So experiment for this last minute now. Feel a sense of confidence that no matter the particulars of the moment, that the heart can abide in love, appreciation, keeping love in mind. And we'll take a moment to <clears throat> adjust, stretch out. Uh, tonight we'd uh, wait to the end in case people would like to send out our good wishes to other people. Um, so we'll do that at the end. <clears throat> but let's take some time now and just check in together. I often say at this time, some of you have heard me that you know, we're all living our lives in relationship with all the other beings who are in relationship. <clears throat> it's not surprising that we would have learned a thing or two about love and what gets in the way. And remember when we use the word love or metta or any of the particular flavors of maybe we could say spiritual love, we're really talking about this trustworthy quality. And really the essence of love is that inclusivity, like the heart. In fact, that's one of the images I have found so useful in the early Buddhist tradition for these qualities of the heart. It said that in the same way that water knows how to take the shape of whatever vessel you pour it into. So, you know, if you have a fancy vase that's in a strange shape, water doesn't have any problem filling that space. And that's the image or the simile that's used for <clears throat> the qualities of love. It's like that inclusive quality of wisdom and awareness that knows how to include that we call love. It's like whatever might happen in any moment of our life, when that aspect of love is there, we know how to show up, we know how to connect, we know how to include what we're experiencing in the moment. We're not surprised. We're not thinking, oh, I'll be loving when this changes. If it's really hard to bear, then we have compassion. If we still can't take it, then we have compassion for that not being able to take it, <laughs> right? We can have compassion for that. So love is really nimble in that way. And in order to be really nimble, we need to develop the quality of mudita because some of you know this, one of the hardest things for us to be loving and open with are when good things are happening to ourselves or to other people, right? And all of a sudden we feel like, you know, in, that our world is limited. And if somebody's having a lot of success or a lot of happiness, that means I'm not going to be happy. Have you noticed that kind of stingy feeling when somebody around us, a friend is having a lot of good stuff happening to them? So in any case, this is a time because we're all learning about 
the disadvantages of our heart when it's trapped with some flavor of fear or aversion. It may be totally justified, the fear and aversion, but honestly, when we look, it's not helpful even if it's justified. It's not helping ourselves and it's not helping others. And so the interesting spiritual question is, how can we plant seeds of love in any moment? And tonight, in particular, how can we plant seeds of this particular capacity to appreciate what's good? It's not just around the loving kindness practices, but it's really everything in spiritual life. It's like, as a, as a spiritual person, we need all kinds of instructions because sometimes our heart is in a really gross or dense place. So the way we're gonna practice with our heart the techniques or the strategies are going to be relatively gross to match. Like if I'm a desperate human being and I more of my desperate emotional and psychological qualities are getting triggered, then I need strategies that work at that level. But if my mind is in a very peaceful, refined, expansive place, then the strategies that work over here would be totally not helpful over there. And that's hard because, you know, what we do in a simplistic way is if a strategy works, we want to use it everywhere. <laughs> so one of the difficult things we learn in spiritual life is, no, this is the right tool for where my heart is at. Not this tool. I like that tool, but it's not really going to be helpful now. It's too heavy. It's too gross. What's a more refined tool that might be more useful in this moment? And that's one of the things you really, we all want to learn, even if we don't get to that place often, we want to know or have that skill of abiding where we're really, it's much more, you know, that thing we did when we were teenagers where, you know, usually there was an adult telling us how to do this, but you'd stand and you'd fall back and there'd be like four people, your friends behind you and they'd catch you. And the whole idea was you kind of develop trust and community if you had trustworthy friends. Well, it's a little bit like that with that, because that feeling of love is subtle when it's in this more refined state. And we really want to, it, it's an act of faith to drop the mental images, the memories and the phrases. And just to trust that this refined lightness of love is enough of a so-called meditation object that I don't need the phrases or the memory. If I need it later, I can always bring it back in, but I'm gonna just rest in that light, beautiful, refined expansion of love. But you know, it, it could be just working with compassion, but let's talk about it in terms of appreciative joy or mudita, even when we're with a difficult person what might naturally lend itself to the arising of appreciation? Like noticing, you know what? I really trust my heart not to act out being around this difficult person, right? That's a good thing. Like that this heart knows how to avoid stepping in it, you know, or saying the wrong thing. May that goodness, may that clarity, may that strong motivation not to make a mess of this interaction, not to trigger this other person, let's say. May that goodness continue, may it increase, may it never end. Like that sila, like sila, some of you know that word, uh, that deep resonant commitment to not cause harm. And when we're, when we're around a difficult person, it's easy because we feel justified to sort of, they're shooting arrows at us. We feel justified shooting arrows back at them in our body language, in our words, even in what we don't say. And to sort of not take the bait and to really appreciate that capacity to not take the bait. Oh, that's wisdom. May that goodness of wisdom continue. May it increase, may it never end. So remember, we don't always we can't always see something like what might be strongly obvious in looking at another being is their unskillfulness. And we may, it may not be possible to be really clear about something wholesome in them 
in certain moments because all of those wholesome qualities that they may have are just have retreated. <laughs> and, and what's in the forefront right now for this person or this other being are not their wholesome qualities. So why force it? Because we can see wholesome here. Or even aspects of nature can be appreciated, like some people mention, you know, the blueness of the sky, the shine of the sun. There's all kinds of ordinary things to appreciate the fact that folks built a road here and I have a place to park, you know. So this appreciation is really, uh, we, we want to have this faith that it's always possible to appreciate just like it's always a possible to recognize the truth of suffering and to have compassion. And it's always possible to be friendly and it's always possible to have this radiant balance. Wow, the world is some kind of mystery and I know how to be intimate without even imagining I could ever comprehend it, right? That's, that's that radiance of compassion. And I liked what you said so much, Lee, about the smile. I think that's just worth repeating because even the idea in my mind of smile can be a nice, like a wormhole to any of the four qualities of love. So play with both a physical smile, but even the idea of the face smiling can be supportive. And you can even imagine as if energetically the heart has a smile, that image of your heart, because there's something about the smile that is radiant. And so it's a useful, um, I don't know what I'd call it, Dharma technique, skillful means for these practices, the idea and the actual smile, even a very faint smile. And you'll see, sometimes it looks a little weird, but if you observe people sitting, Sometimes they'll have just a subtle smile and you see these in some of the statues in Buddhism, the, like the Buddha will have a sublime, subtle smile because it's a, it's a meditation technique, especially if you go around life with a, a crown, you know, then when you sit to create a counterweight to that tendency, because the body affects the mind in the same way the mind affects the body. So we can take advantage of that by shaping the body in a way that's supportive of what we're looking for in the mind. Yeah, no, that's really wise. And it's what you describe much more um, on the level of wisdom practice. Like when we do our Vipassana or insight meditation, it is that kind of deconstruction. So if I'm being irritated by something. And then the habit of my mind uh, is exactly what you said, you know, to sort of pathologize that person, they're bad and they're irritating me. And then what wisdom practice is all about is to observe things just as they are, right? And so what we notice, it's not that that person's negative quality is coming and attacking me, it's my aversive or judgmental mind is attacking whatever quality that I'm hearing through sound or seeing through sight, right? And my mind is in a way attacking it. And that's really what aversion is or fear. It's our mind attacking something. And the question of whether someone's good or bad, that, you know, what in a Buddhist sense, what makes something bad is the, the um, kinds of impressions that are being laid down in one's heart and in those hearts around me. So if I'm act, if I'm doing something, saying something, acting in some way, then the only way anybody could know is if somehow they were able to read what sort of impressions are getting laid down in my heart, given that I said that or acted in that way, were those wholesome seeds leading towards a greater release? Or were they impressions that are leading to more contraction and stress? That's really the definition of what makes something wholesome or unwholesome, skillful or unskillful. So your point, and this is what every elementary teacher learns, you know, you don't say that's a bad student, right? Or a mother or father, that behavior 
you know, when you do this, this is how, what, how I experience that, or how do you experience it, right? We really try to look at the particular experience and what it sets in motion, as opposed to defining a person as difficult. But you do hear that because in one of the commentaries, they talk about, you know, having, you know, having at the ready a person who, when you bring them to mind, very easy to love. But how about having a person when you bring them to mind evokes fear or aversion? Then they call that person, you know, the, the challenging or the difficult person. But it just means it's difficult for me to be loving to that person. And the idea and the practice is to start where it's easy, but to be able to work with even the people it's not easy with. Find a way to, to kind of expand the capacity of being friendly and loving so that there isn't anybody we can bump up against because we've worked on them with our imagination as well as, you know, in real time when we bump into them. Another one from Thich Nhat Hanh is, uh, this is, this may be a little bit of a paraphrase, but it's something like long live impermanence. You know, he was sort of, impermanence isn't bad. So he goes, long live impermanence. It makes everything possible, right? There wouldn't be change, any positive change without the truth of impermanence. We determine wholesome or unwholesome, right? Mm -hmm. It's really how we're relating to the feeling tone that determines, because the feeling tone of our inner and outer experience, that's really nature. We don't, no one has anything to say like that mm -hmm. somebody would be going through a time in their life where there would be a lot of inner unpleasantness mm -hmm. or outer unpleasantness. Mm -hmm. That's due to so many causes and conditions that aren't really in the realm of practice. Mm. But what the mind, what the heart does with the, or we might have a lot of pleasantness in our outer healthy and we're beautiful and people love us, or we might have a lot of external unpleasantness. But in any case, what makes something wholesome or unwholesome really is about, given the way I'm relating, what mm. sort of impressions are getting laid down in my mind stream. Mm. So I'm acting in a way. So what gets carried forward, given that I'm acting or relating in a particular way, what gets carried forward? Seeds mm. of being tight or seeds of releasing. Mm. And that's really what makes something wholesome or skillful, unwholesome mm. or unskillful. It's the, really about the quality of the intention or the quality of the motivation. Is that quality being colored by greed, hatred, and delusion? Mm. Or is the quality being colored by kindness, compassion, mm. wisdom, letting go? And, and I don't know if people realize, but that four quarters chant that we do in the morning sits and sometimes uh, at other points, that's, those are the Buddha's words. So I think for me, that's meaningful. Like there's some potency in those words and, and wisdom behind the choice. And I think it's okay for us to do riffs because who knows about how it's actually supposed to be translated into English. So there is a little room for the creativity of how you, you know, modify that, that phrase, especially when you're using it in your own mind as a kind of um, instruction. But I'd, I'd encourage people to memorize the basic form of the four quarters chant and then put it into your own words using that basic structure. Yeah. And I don't know if people felt this, but, you know, when we give ourselves that, you know, and we just sort of relax into that way of perceiving or relating to this moment to learn how to relate to the moment as a river, a changing, never stopping river. And what does that do to the heart? What kind of impression does it lead? Because so much of the violence and meanness in the world is when we're in those moments when we're operating from a fixed static point of view, because then stealing and oppressing and taking advantage, it can make a lot of sense because we have this permanent static sense of the world. But when things are seen in this changing nature, clinging 
you know, just it just doesn't make sense. The roots of hate and greed don't make sense when we're aligning with the truth of change. That's why it's such a big deal, not just in Buddhism. It's just about more than anything about being real. You know, who are we when we're living in alignment with the truth of change? And who are we when we're living with this fixed idea of, you know, there's a me in some kind of permanent lasting sense. Now I can justify all kinds of terrible things when I have that static sense of me, that permanent sense of me. Because then I'm afraid someone's gonna take that permanent sense away, right? That's a really wonderful example of that, the nature of expansion, because it, it really shifts the understanding where like part of abiding, and I forget who it was, was really enjoying, uh, Sandy maybe talking about that word abiding, and, or uh, Venerable Analio talks about instead of doing the loving kindness or doing the appreciative joy, being the appreciative joy, and it's, it, it's exactly the, what you would describe karma is that change where nothing can be a problem because the love will love it. So I don't have to like fear versus love. I don't have to be afraid of fear because I'll love it. I'll care about it with compassion or something like that. And that's the thing, like when we're really in that more expanded open space of love, then love doesn't have a, love knows what to do with everything. If it's painful, there's compassion. If it's beautiful, there's appreciative joy. If it's confusing, there's equanimity. Otherwise there's just boundless friendliness, goodness of heart. And the other thing that's important what Karma said, and I think Juni said it too, is just, it really is useful to, have, to recognize the felt sense in the body, right? Because that can really help the, the greater suffusion, like it's going everywhere. So that means it's touching everywhere in the body, everywhere in the world. I mean, we use that sense first and foremost, the body's gonna feel affected by the presence of love maybe initially in the heart, maybe initially somewhere, but then just, if we can't make it happen, but we can be curious about if it can, if everything can be touched, be affected by the love. Boundless. Well, let's just go ahead then. I thought we'd just come back to those words from the Buddha and uh, we'll just go through it once. And then we'll just take maybe two minutes. And during those last two minutes, if there's a name of a friend that you just feel and recognize the goodness in their life, you know, you can just say that quality and maybe that person's first name. And it could be somebody that everybody knows like a celebrity type person, or it might be just a personal friend or the name of your pet, it doesn't really matter but we're just getting a sense of the vastness of the goodness, okay? So like we did at the beginning, let's chant this together. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with gladness Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable.
without hostility and without ill will. I would just take a couple minutes. Maybe I'll begin. Some of you know Shelley Graff, our wonderful associate, associate director at Common Ground. They graduated from their four year teacher training program sponsored by Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts. It's a big deal. I'm really grateful for Shelley's presence in our community and yeah, and that they graduated just shining and appreciating all that goodness. It's just really great, simple, but really great that we're here together. And so may all this goodness being here together, may it continue and increase and never end. And may the seeds of this goodness be the cause for happiness everywhere. May it be so. And so sweet to be with everybody tonight. Thanks so much. In two weeks, not next Saturday, but the following Saturday, might be the 22nd, uh, Shelly Graff and Wynn Fricky, the co-founder of Common Ground and my spouse, most of you know, will be teaching a day-long retreat that Saturday, I think the 22nd, 9.30 to 4. You can sign up for that. It should be really great. Um, Wynn is usually real busy, but their semester at McAllister College is coming to a close and she'll have more time to teach. So that's really great. I think she's also going to teach in June for one of the Sunday mornings, maybe on the 13th of June. So you could catch Wynn's talks then too. Great. And lots of other things, of course, coming up, including the twice annual community practice intensive beginning, I think Monday, the 7th of June. And it ends on a day long on the 26th. I'll be leading that uh, time where people just have to <coughs> practice for a couple of weeks. So join in if you'd like more information on our calendar, of course.